attendees know, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And second of all, at the end of the presentation, there'll be um, a survey link for you guys to fill out. It's just four questions really quick. It helps us with some metrics for our organization. And then to just go over a couple housekeeping things as far as this presentation, Chris has built in a few stopping points to answer questions. And so we'll do that. Um, if you just wanna leave whatever questions you have, you can type them into the Q&A section that's at the bottom of um, the Zoom format. And we'll pick just one or two questions to answer in each of those blocks of windows. And then at the end of the presentation, if we have enough time, we can open it up and chat a bit further. We'll see how it goes. So everybody enjoy and thank you so much, Chris. All right. Well, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming in out from outside where it's really nice today to listen to this. I wanted to start with some real basic statistics. Um, and it starts with this, which is that worldwide there are 1.7 million different species of insects that are described. And what that means is that someone has found it, uh, written up a description of it, and gotten it published in a scientific journal. So it takes a lot of work to describe an insect. There's way more species out there that have been described. And so the estimates are 10 to 80 million different species of insects. That's, and that's not counting all the other things that sort of look like insects, like arachnids and centipedes and millipedes and all the others. Just in North America, and these are estimates, again, these are not described, these are what we think might be out there. We're talking about 163,000 kinds of insects, 35,000 species of arachnids. And I'm curious to know if anybody knows, and you just have to answer this for yourself here, uh, which group of insects has the most species in North America, estimated? because I think you might be surprised that it's flies. So insects in the order Diptera are called flies, um, and they're first in North America in terms of 61,000 species of flies. So just think about that for a second and think how many flies you can name, uh, and then think of that there's you know 60,990 some more, I'll bet. So this one here, is probably a house fly. I'm not going to guarantee that it's a house fly because there are a lot of other flies that look like house flies. Uh, but this is what most people would think of when you think about flies. But this is also a fly. This is called a picture wing fly. It looks like it has a gas mask on. Uh, the males attract females. The, they, they well, all of them eat rotting vegetation. And then the males will regurgitate a little bubble of that, that regurgitated vegetation. Uh, and that's what looks attractive to females, so they walk around with bubbles sticking out of their mouths, apparently. Some of the flies that we have are really big, like this black horse fly, which is uh, inch and a half long, maybe, inch, inch and a half long. And then some of them are really tiny, like this little one, I have no idea what this is, but it has the white abdomen. And then some of them are even more small. So this is Indian grass, one of our native prairie grasses, and you can just barely see that tiny little fly sitting there on the right hand side of it. There are bee flies that are pollinators, like these little hover flies or flower flies. Um, these are not very fuzzy, so they don't actually carry a lot of pollen around. They, they eat a lot of pollen. They don't necessarily pollinate as effectively as something like this fly, which is more fuzzy, looks more like a bee also. And you could be uh, you know, excused for thinking this is a bee, but if you look at the size of the eyes, and the fact that the antenna are really short, we'll actually talk about this again later, but that's how you tell the difference. Here's a fly that's pollinating a little plant uh, called pussy toes, because it looks like a little cat foot. And you can see all the pollen that's stuck to the hairy parts of this fly. In fact, here's the same species of plant with three more fly species that I photographed all on the same day in the same little patch of this flower. And I wanted to highlight one of these because this is a tachinid fly, which is a group of flies that has a really interesting story. They have uh, larvae that are parasitic. So they will lay eggs, the adults will lay eggs on something like a caterpillar, and then the larvae will hatch out and they'll actually burrow inside that caterpillar or some kind of insect and sort of eat it out from the inside um, while it's alive for a while at least. So it sort of sounds like a nasty little creature, but they're actually really helpful uh, in terms of controlling pest insects and just sort of regulating populations of, of invertebrates overall. 
This fun little creature is called a bee fly. Um, it's got a long proboscis, if you can see on the bottom right there, that's long and stiff. It can't fold it up, it can't do anything with it except letting it sit out in front of it. Um, and it will hover in front of a fly and, or a flower and stick that proboscis inside where it can uh, pull the nectar out of the flower. Another kind of fly that you wouldn't probably recognize as a fly is called a crane fly. A lot of these look like giant mosquitoes. So if you see them and it looks like a mosquito, but it just looks like it's way too big to be a mosquito, probably a crane fly. Um, the adults of these don't live very long and they either feed on pollen or they don't feed at all as adults. And the uh, larvae uh, live underground and feed on roots. And this one is a mosquito. And I bring this up because mosquitoes are technically flies. So they are in that order, diptera. So among that 61,000 species of flies we think are out there are quite a few different mosquitoes. There's a lot of different mosquito species out there. And then there's more flies that have, and I'm not gonna spend the whole time on flies, but just the fact that I've talked this long about flies gives you a feel for how many there are out there. Uh, this is called a long-legged fly, and it turns out it's a predator. And I didn't know it was a predator because it doesn't look like a predator until I got this picture in my backyard of a, a long-legged fly eating a fly, or eating a little ant. So I immediately went inside, looked it up, and sure enough, they are predators and ants are one of their primary food sources. Other flies like robber flies look more like predators. This looks like a fighter plane type of flying predator. This one has caught a little leaf hopper, which it's hanging off of its long uh, kind of black mouth part there. What robber flies do is they'll fly out and they will uh, catch an insect, usually in air, but not always. And then they will circle back and land on a perch and then they inject it with a venom that paralyzes it eventually kills it and liquefies its insides and it just sucks the juices right out of the fly, which is actually a really common way that predators feed in the insect world. But this is a robber fly eating a small insect and this is a robber fly eating a much bigger insect. So this robber fly took down this cicada, which is at least three times its size in mass. Uh, and my daughter, Anna, who might be on the call right now, uh, was with me when we saw this. We were walking around in the, in the hills up along the Niobrara River we heard a cicada take off from our feet, and then it sort of stopped making noise suddenly uh, in the middle of the flight, and so we walked over to see what was going on, and sure enough, this robber fly had knocked it out of the air and then had found a place to insert its mouth part in there and finish it off. Whew. Okay, so that's just flies, and this is a good time to say that I am not an entomologist. I am an ecologist and somebody who is really interested in insects and other uh, invertebrates like that. It's not my specialty. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a lot of things that I happen to know, but there's way more that I don't know out there. Uh, so ask lots of questions if you want, but don't expect me to know all the answers because that's not my, my expertise. Um, but having said that, I do want to talk about the fact that insects do a lot of different things for us. And when I say insects, I'm talking about invertebrates in general, but it just, insects is a lot easier to say than invertebrates. But anything from decomposition and nutrient cycling, pollination, soils, herbivory, predation, parasitism, there's all kinds of things that um, are going on. Oh, uh, somebody asked if that was a robber fly. Yes, robber fly is correct. Um, anyway, so parasitism, predation, and all the insects and invertebrates we see above ground, that's about one-tenth of what is below ground. So there's 10 times more biomass of invertebrates below ground where we can't see them than above ground, which is sort of staggering to think about. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that in invertebrate diversity is tied to plant diversity. So plant diversity is super important for lots of things in ecology. Uh, and this applies to your garden as well as to natural areas like prairies or woodlands. Plant diversity drives insect diversity for a few reasons. A big one is that there are host plants for some in insect species. So the monarch caterpillar on the right is a great example that a lot of people are familiar with, that monarch caterpillars can only feed on milkweed. So you have to have milkweed if you want monarchs. But there are a lot of other species of insects that have a host plant or a set of host plants that they rely on. So the more species of plants you have, the more hosts, you have, more hosts are available for the insects that need them. Um, Pollinators are a real special case. We'll talk about them more in a little bit. But they need plant diversity mostly because they need a lot of different flowers blooming through the season so they have consistent food sources. 
because every plant only blooms for usually a few weeks at a time and then they're done. And so you've got to have this succession of different plant species blooming and a range of choices for a lot of pollinators. You can't just feed on whatever's blooming. They have specialized parts that allow them to feed on some things but not others. And then another reason that plant diversity is important is just the structure. In a prairie, for example, you've got every plant has its own architecture and it creates this sort of combination of, of habitat structure that's very different than if you just had a bunch of grasses that all look the same. And those structures are really important for invertebrates that have different habitat needs, especially uh, having to thermoregulate or regulate their temperature by moving from sun to shade and, and also being safe from predators while they do that. So let's take a second and talk about herbivores in general. And I want to start with, caterp or with caterpillars, with grasshoppers, because grasshoppers are fascinating. And there's a group of insects that I don't know that people think about very often as being diverse. But just in Nebraska, we have 108 identified grasshopper species. Uh, and I know that there's going to be a few more in the next iteration of the Grasshoppers of Nebraska guide that comes out. Uh, but 108 is still a lot. And of that group, maybe six or eight can be problematic uh, in terms of being an economic pest at times. Some of those are in crop fields, some of those are in rangelands. Uh, and I think all of them that can be pests are just, they're basically native species that are adapted really well to the way that we're managing the landscape right now. Um, but the rest of those 108 species are really diverse in what they do. Some of them eat only grasses, some of them eat grasses and wildflowers, some of them eat only wildflowers, some specialize on some kinds of wildflowers. So they're not just this sort of voracious eating machine that causes problems all over the place. Um, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. So there are some that are just big and brown, there are some that are green, there are some that are green with funny red antenna and a little ridge on their back. Um, there are some that are flightless and, and also very large. This is a plains lover. This is the largest grasshopper we have in the state. Uh, they can be the size of a small mouse. Uh, the little wing that they have right there, that little black speckled peach colored, salmon colored wing, that's the biggest it gets because this is a full grown adult with a full grown wing, but it's a flightless grasshopper. So the plains lover is not gonna fly away from you. It's gonna hop or crawl away from you if it wants to. And it's a pretty one, but this is, I think, gotta be the most gorgeous grasshopper in the state. This is called the painted grasshopper. Uh, it's another flightless grasshopper. So this is an adult with its little vestigial wings there. Um, these are much more common in the Western part of the state and they're just amazingly colorful. Um, further north and south, you get variations on these colors. Some of them are more yellow and black, some are more red and black but they have that kind of general pattern like that. Some are very camouflaged, uh, like this toothpick grasshopper, which if I hadn't seen it move to where it was when it landed, I probably wouldn't have noticed it as I walked by because it's incredibly well camouflaged. This one might beat that one for camouflage. This is uh, also an interesting story because it specializes on the plant that it's sitting on. So this is uh, a species of grasshopper called the sagewort grasshopper and it's sitting on sage wort or white sage. And I just, I love the camouflage in terms of the color, but also look at the little green speckles on its head and compare that to the little green speckles that you see on the plants, just astonishingly well camouflaged. And you can see these wherever you have this white sage or, or cudweed sage wort or whatever you wanna call that plant. You look closely, kind of rub your foot across the plant as you walk through. Sometimes you'll see these little white grasshoppers jump out. You probably won't see them ahead of time. Uh, another really neat, really camouflaged grasshopper. Uh, there's a bunch of these that are incredibly camouflaged. They, they like these open sandy areas or open ground. And then when they fly, they display their really colorful wings that look like butterflies, but they're noisy as they fly off. They have this kind of clack, 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 clack flight, which I think is meant to startle whatever is trying to chase it uh, and give it a chance to get away. Uh, but the color is gorgeous, yellows and reds and, and oranges with these real black bands around the bottoms of those wings. And this is a neat little graphic. Well, okay, it's a, it's a uh, very amateurish little graphic, but the point of this is if you took all the bison on a pasture that were, so if you have this, a sustainable number of bison on a huge area of prairie, and you took all those bison, you put them on a scale, and on the other side of that scale, you put all the grasshoppers on that same area of prairie, they would balance each other out. So in other words, the biomass of grasshoppers and the biomass of bison in a prairie are the same. 
And this works just the same with cattle. If you have a, a pasture that's stocked well with cattle, uh, the grasshoppers and the cattle would weigh the same. And it also works with ants. So think about all the ants that it takes to weigh just the same as one cow, and then multiply that by the number of cattle that you might see in a pasture. That's a lot of ants, and they uh, are mostly hidden beneath the ground or running along the ground, so you don't notice they're there. But there's an incredible biomass of invertebrates out there. Okay, so we've talked about herbivores just in terms of grasshoppers so far, but and they're chewing animals. They chew up their, their food. But a lot of invertebrates that are herbivores actually use these sort of sucking mouth, mouth parts um, and they stick them into the plant and then they just sort of suck the juices out like these little stink bugs are doing here. Cicadas also have that same kind of mouth part. Um, and if you look closely at this cicada, another thing about cicadas and a lot of other invertebrates is they have more than two eyes. So they have the two sort of big eyes that you see here but if you look closely, they've got a, a triangle of little eyes here in the middle where there's, there's one, two, three little simple eyes, which are also called ocelli. Um, they basically just see light and dark. We don't know for sure why they have them, but the assumption is because they're in a triangle, they're probably used for orientation in some way, whether that's navigation or just knowing if it's upright or not, um, or maybe helping to, to see a predator coming by seeing a shadow or something like that, we don't really know. But if you start looking closely at cicadas or praying mantises or grasshoppers or a lot of other insects, they have that little triangle of simple eyes right on top of their head. Another thing about cicadas is that cicadas, which some people also call locusts, but they are cicadas, cicadas live most of their lives underground, which is true for a lot of different invertebrates. But you might see uh, either this a live larva like this crawling out of the ground or a lot of times you'll see the empty shells during the summer of the cicadas that have come up out of the ground where they spent the last year or much more some, in some cases uh, living off the roots of plants where they just sort of attach themselves to a root and then they come out, they molt out of those, those exoskeletons and they become their adult form where they live for maybe a few weeks to a month or so uh, as an adult and they make a lot of noise and attract mates and mate and lay, lay eggs and then die. And you may have heard of the periodic cicadas or the 17-year cicadas. In this case, there are 17-year, 15-year, 13-year, I can't remember all the variations. But 17-year cicadas are named that because they spend 17 years underground and then they all emerge sort of in a huge group um, as adults every 17 years. And they just sort of cover all the trees in a, in a local area. But they don't do it every, like everywhere in the country at the same time. They're not synchronized that way. In fact, if you want, you can go on uh, Google and you can just type in 17 year cicada map and you can find a map that will show you around the country where the 17 year cicadas are gonna be coming out this year. And so if you really needed some reason to travel uh, and plan a vacation, you could plan your vacation around where the 17 year cicadas are gonna be every year or plan to avoid them, I guess, if you don't like the noise, but imagine living for 17 years underground and then popping out all at once. The reason we think they do that is that it gets the predators off their, off their backs. So if you know as a predator, and this is as knowing is like an evolutionary term here, but you know, if, if you get adapted to the fact that every summer there's a thousand or a million cicadas that are gonna come out at a certain time, predator populations could build up their population. They could sort of synchronize themselves so that when those cicadas come out, they're ready to take advantage of them. But if it only happens every 17 years, that's really hard to adapt to as another species. So it kind of keeps every, all the predators off kilter. And just, there's a lot of different kinds of cicadas in Nebraska. I haven't met anybody who knows how many different cicada species we have, um, but it's, it's way more than a few. This is a uh, specialized herbivore called a dogbane beetle that feeds only on this plant or primarily on this plant, which is related to milkweed. It has the same kind of toxic latex that milkweed has. This is a milkweed plant, so this is butterfly milkweed with a giant milkweed bug. And here's another milkweed specialist called a longhorn milkweed beetle. And all of these specialists on milkweed and dogbane have figured out some way to deal with a toxin that most other insects can't figure out how to deal with. So it, if they would, it would kill them if they ate milkweed, but these insects either eat around the toxin or they can process the toxin in a way that others can't. And what it does is it gives them sort of a, a, 
an open species of plant to feed on where there's not a lot of other competition. So they've sort of carved out their own little niche. And of course, the most famous of those milkweed specialists is the monarch uh, butterfly with its caterpillar here. Okay, I'm gonna talk about pollinators, but before we do, let's take a quick break. And are there any questions that we want to address real quick, Michaela? So we have um, George McMillan is asking what kind of camera and lens that you use to make um, such beautiful photos. I use a fairly inexpensive Nikon camera. It's a D7100. Uh, I think you can buy one used in good shape for around $600. Uh, more importantly, I use a 105 millimeter macro lens on that Nikon D7100. Um, there's a newer version, an older version. I like the older version because I can buy them for a few hundred dollars. But uh, that 105 millimeter lets me stay a little bit further away from an insect than like a 50 millimeter macro and still, uh, you know, zoom in close, mag magnify it enough to get a good photo. Most important though is the tripod and even more important than that is patience because I miss way more photos than I get. Mm. Uh, cool. And then Melissa Brewer was asking, where can she get a Grasshoppers of Nebraska guide? Uh, that's a good question. I think you can download a PDF online. Yeah, I think you just, I just Googled Grasshoppers of Nebraska. Matthew Brust is the author of it. Um, and I think it's a downloadable PDF, if I remember right. Okay, cool. Yeah, Ray Powers is saying that you can buy it online from UNL. UNL extension. extension. There you go. Thanks, Ray. Um, and then... Kara Hiller is wondering if all cicadas have five eyes. As far as I know, yes. Cool. But you have uh, to look really close to see them. Yeah. And then the last question is if um, Kathy uh, Pretty, Prettyman is saying that the, the milkweed specialist beetle looks a lot like a Japanese beetle, and how do you tell the difference? Yeah, that dogbane beetle really does look a lot like it, especially. The, the biggest, the easiest difference is the Japanese beetles have kind of some white speckling along the very sides of their body mm -hmm. that the dogbane beetle doesn't have. The dogbane beetle is very solid, green, shiny, uh, and they're a little smaller, but that's a little harder to see. But those, those Japanese beetles, the characteristic things, they have kind of little white blocks or, or checks along the side of their body. Um, Jan Buckholt is asking, um, are the insects that are specialized for dogbane and milkweed also beneficial to them? Um, I wouldn't say they're beneficial to milkweed, mm -hmm. but I, they rarely are abundant enough that they cause significant damage where it's gonna really hurt the plant. Um, so they're not beneficial, but they're not super harmful either. Cool. And then the last question that we'll take for this break is from Sophie, who's five years old, and she's asking, why do grasshoppers jump so high? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I think the biggest reason that grasshoppers jump probably is to get away from predators, right? So they uh, imagine a grasshopper sitting on a leaf, chewing away, and there's a, a, a little praying mantis or a bird that's stalking up on it, and all of a sudden that grasshopper jumps five feet away, um, that's a pretty good way to escape a predator that thought, thought it was going to have a, a meal pretty quickly. So that's an excellent question. We have, we'll take one last question from CJ Perry's son, who's asking if there's any good bugs in Nebraska to eat. Uh, that depends on who you ask, <laughs> but uh, I would say absolutely. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that, that eat grasshoppers and crickets. Uh, I think most people like to cook them first. I have a friend that um, when the 17 year cicadas come out, uh, he's developed recipes for how to use 17 year cicadas as food sources, um, including pizza toppings, which wow. I enjoy pizzas a lot and I enjoy cicadas a lot. I don't know that I would combine them, but uh, I guess you can. So yeah, there's a lot of options. I'm not, I'm not a, an, an entomologist or a chef, so I'll let other people specialize on those things, but uh, I'm sure you can find recipes. Cicada pizza sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's very crunchy, I'll bet. Yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah. Well, let's jump into predators then, or predators, paras uh, pollinators. I'm starting with this one, which is the honeybee, only because I want to talk about the fact that honeybees get a lot of attention right now, but they're not really what we should be focusing on as we worry about pollinators. Honeybees are an introduced species that we brought in basically as a livestock species to help, help us pollinate crops. Um, so they've been in the 
in the, on the continent since the 1600s. <clears throat> and there's not anything wrong necessarily with honeybees, but honeybee populations are closely managed by the people who take care of them. And so if a honeybee pop colony collapses, it'll be replaced because we've got essentially honeybee farmers out there that'll replace it. So it's not that there aren't concerns, but all the wild populations of bees that we have out there don't have that kind of safety net. And so if you really want to worry about pollinators and do something for pollinators that help both our food source and all the native plants that need pollination, it's really the wild bees that matter. And those include bees of all different shapes and sizes, including little green sweat bees, um, bees that you could be uh, excused for thinking they're like honeybees, but they're not. Um, lots of different colors, shapes, sizes. Some of them have really long antenna. Um, bumblebees are pretty recognizable, but even with bumblebees, there are 20 different kinds of bumblebees in the state, including some that uh, raid the nests of others and basically steal, uh, you know, lay their eggs in another bumblebee's nest so that they don't have to raise them themselves. Crazy stories out there with bumblebees. My favorite bee in the state that I've found, and I've only seen it a couple of times, is this one, which is a blue sage bee, and it specializes on pitcher sage, which is what's shown here, or otherwise known as blue sage. So this is the only plant that the blue sage bee can feed on. And I love the fact that it's got blue eyes to match the plant, um, and I love the fact that it has this really neat specialized relationship, which can make life hard, um, because you've got to make sure that the bee is, can only be out in the world when its flower is blooming. So it's really tightly uh, restricted that way. And hopefully as the climate continues to change and blooming times change, the bee will continue as it has apparently so far, adjusting its emergence time every year so it doesn't miss the window. But it's a, it's a neat example of a bee that's really specialized, which is fairly unique. There, there are bees that are specialized on groups of plants, but not very many that we think are just adapted to one or two species. Um, most bees make their nests uh, by themselves, first of all. So most bees are solitary rather than social like a, queen, like, a, like a honeybee. So there are mason bees and there are bumblebees and a few others that are social with queens and a kind of a worker structure. But for the most part, they're solitary bees where there's a female bee who lays eggs, takes care of the eggs, feed the babies, um, and then and protects them. Uh, all by herself without any help from anybody else. And usually they're in a tunnel of some kind, either a tunnel in a burrow in the ground like this one. And a lot of times bee nests and, and wasp nests will have this little kind of a raised edge around the top that helps distinguish it from, a, from an ant nest or an ant hole. Um, and sometimes they'll be in hollow stems of some kind. So like if you have a garden and you trim your plants high enough, you know, leave a, a foot or a foot and a half the hollow stems from last year's vegetation, a lot of times will get filled up with bees, native bees that will lay eggs in them. And they basically lay an egg, um, go out and collect uh, pollen and nectar, kind of mix it up into a dough ball most of the time, set it next to the egg, seal it off in a little cell. And they'll stack those on top of each other so that when the egg hatches, the larva has food it can eat until it uh, grows large enough to, to become an adult and then it crawls out. So the females basically spend their days out feeding um, themselves to keep going, but more importantly, collecting pollen and nectar, bringing them back to, to provision those eggs and stack them on top of each other. And then when they're not doing that, they're sitting at the edge of these tunnels, protecting them from lots of different kinds of predators that might come in. So bees are our most important pollinator overall for several reasons, including that they tend to go from one to another to another of the same kind of flower where other pollinator species tend to be a little more flighty and less consistent than that. Um, but there are a lot, lots of other pollinators, including paper wasps like this one. Uh, we already talked about some of the flies. There are lots of different kinds of butterfly species, including the, this one, which is the uh, regal fritillary, which is a prairie specialist that its larvae need violets. So it's not gonna be on, in a prairie without violets or in a site that's not a prairie. And of course, monarch butterflies, which, uh, have gotten a lot of attention for good reason lately. I wanted to focus on one more pollinator, which is a pollinator of this species, which is yucca or soapweed. And every species of yucca or every species of soapweed has one species of moth that is the only thing that we know of that pollinates it. Um, the yucca moth looks like this. And basically what has to happen, and the reason that the yucca moth is the only effective pollinator uh, of this plant is that 
the pollen for this plant shows up over here or here or there, but that pollen has to get inside here in order for pollination to happen. And so most insects are gonna, that, that might come in to feed on the pollen aren't really gonna interact uh, with the female part of the plant over here, but the moth will grab the pollen and it'll uh, put it sort of under its mouth and carry it down and then stuff it inside right here and then she'll lay her eggs in there with them. So she completes the fertilization process for the plant, which allows the plants to start making seeds. And then she lays her eggs in there because her larvae, when they hatch, are gonna feed on some of those seeds. And as, as long as they don't feed on all the seeds, the plant gets a lot of benefit out of this because it gets pollinated. The moth gets a lot of benefit out of this because it has food, food for its babies. So it's called a mutualistic relationship. Where the process can break down is if the moth or multiple moths lay too many eggs in one plant, the, all the seeds are gonna eat, get eaten, which is not you know, what, the, what the plant wants. So the crazy thing about this relationship that no one really completely understands, but we know what happens, is that if, the, if there are too many eggs laid inside the, the flower, the plant aborts the flower and drops the flower to the ground and just gives up on it. So it doesn't waste any more energy trying to keep blooming. So you explain to me, because I don't understand it, how the plant keeps track of how many eggs are laid inside its flower. It's an amazing little process that we don't really get yet. Um, okay, and then I wanna talk a little bit about milkweed, not in terms of monarch butterflies, because that's a whole other topic we can talk about, but uh, the process of pollination for milkweed flowers is really interesting because it's basically a series of accidents that have to happen. So if you look closely at a milkweed flower, it's really different from a lot of other milkweed flowers. And now that we zoom up, you might see these little insects here, um, which are thrips, which is a, a kind of small insect that is all over the place, but you don't notice them very often because they're really tiny. But those, those arrows are pointing to little slits in the side of this, this milkweed flower. Inside those slits are, are little packets of pollen that are kind of like little gel packs. They're called pollinia. And there's basically two of them connected by a little thread. And if you look at this wasp, which is crawling around on this swamp milkweed flower, feeding on the nectar, um, and then look at it a few minutes later, this is the same wasp a few minutes later, you can see the little gel packs, those little pollinia stuck to its feet. And the way those got there is that that wasp was crawling around and its leg accidentally slipped inside one of the little slits on those flowers. And when it pulled its leg back out, the pollinia were attached. And at that point, the pollination process is halfway done. But what has to happen to complete that process is the same leg with the pollinia attached has to slip in accidentally to another flower's slit. And then when it pulls its leg out, it has to leave those pollinia behind to complete the fertilization process, which just shouldn't work. That, that's so accidental and so random. There's no way it should work. And yet we have lots of milkweed seeds blowing around uh, every fall. And so it obviously does work. Here's a wasp, the, that same wasp, trying to pull the pollinia off and it's stuck well enough that it couldn't get it off. And yet somehow they become dislodged when they come out of another flower. I don't get how that works. Um, but again, it works really well. And it's not just wasps, it's any insect that crawls around on it. You can see the pollinia here on, the, on two of the legs, at least, of this giant milkweed bug. Um, that's you know accidentally pollinating milkweed flowers. Okay, that's pollinators. Let's talk about predators real quick. Um, and we have to start with spiders because although they're not insects, of course, uh, they are incredibly valuable uh, predators in the invertebrate world. They have eight legs, of course. Um, many of them spin webs, but not all of them do. The ones that we see most often are the ones that spin webs because of course they're obvious and we run into them or we can see them you know, spinning around and feeding on grasshoppers or other things that get caught in the webs. But a lot of them are much harder to see like this grass uh, or this spider which is you know, perfectly camouflaged against this dried grass or this one which is resting on a stem of grass uh, all folded up so it looks like just part of the plant. Um, spiders of course, it elicit responses from people uh, that are not always pleasant. Uh, sometimes just because they're surprising, sometimes because they're creepy looking. Um, there are a lot of people who have a phobia of spiders. 
what I found working with kids especially is that if I can have five or 10 minutes with a kid and demonstrate holding a spider on my hand, uh, most of the time by the end of that five or 10 minutes, the kid also has a spider in their hand. The spiders in Nebraska, the vast, vast majority of them are not harmful to people. Every spider is venomous. Every spider can inject venom into something that it bites, but most of them, A, don't have uh, the ability to bite people in a way that punctures the skin, and B, they don't want to. Um, doctors are getting much better at now at diagnosing what we used to call spider bites. So a lot of people wake up in the morning with a little red bump of some kind and they're like, oh, spider bites. Almost never are those spider bites. If you have a spider bite um, that's from a dangerous spider, like a black widow or brown recluse, you'll know. Um, but something that's just itchy or a little painful in the morning is probably something other than a spider bite. Most spiders are completely harmless. And I've picked up spiders, I don't know how many thousands of times. I've never been bitten by one. It doesn't mean I won't be, but I've never have. Um, and the other thing that you should know about them is many of them are good mothers, uh, including this black and yellow garden spider, which is protecting her egg sac at the bottom of her web. And then probably the best example of great moms in spider world is uh, the wolf spider, which the wolf spider carries her egg sac around with her until they hatch. And then once they hatch, the babies ride around on top of the mom uh, for as long as they can until they get too big for that to work. And so this is a really neat story and a really cool story if you like spiders or if you're neutral to spiders. But this is also where the, the sort of nightmare scenario happens if you don't like spiders and you try to step on one and you step on it and then all of a sudden there's thousands of little spiders that come out of it. They're not coming out of it. They were just crawling around on top because those were the babies and you just killed their mom. Uh, crab spiders are named because they have these really long, extra long front legs and they're ambush predators. So this fly got a little bit too close to this crab spider, which was just sitting perfectly still on this flower, and a second later got grabbed and then got bitten. Uh, the spider bit it, and just like the robber fly we talked about later or earlier, it injected venom that paralyzed the fly, started to liquefy the insides, and the, that the spider then sort of reconfigured it and got found a better place to bite it, finished that process and then went off and, and hid under a leaf and finished sucking all the juices out of that fly until it was just a dry husk. That's how many spiders, well that's how all spiders feed, but crab spiders are really good at that ambush process with those extra long legs. And if you look closely at flowers, uh, you'll see a lot more of them than you might have thought were there. Again, completely harmless to people. Here's one that caught a big butterfly, which made the butterfly a lot easier to photograph, by the way. Not all of them are super well camouflaged. Uh, like this one sort of seems like it clashes a little bit against this pink thistle, but some can change colors to be camouflaged. They can change from white to yellow or back uh, within a, a day or two to help camouflage themselves on different kinds of flowers. Uh, so this is a giant wolf spider, not a giant wolf spider officially, but this is a big wolf spider. Um, and I just wanted to show you this picture partly because I wanted to show you those thick hairs that are sticking up from the top of its legs. Spiders, and especially wolf spiders, use their hairs as sensors. And with its eyes closed or in the pitch dark, it can still, just by using its hairs, tell a lot about the prey that it's chasing. It can tell what it is, how fast it's moving, how big it is, what direction it's going. And they can catch prey, even in the pitch darkness, um, just by using those sensory hairs that they, they have all over their bodies, but especially on their legs. Ah, these are so amazing. This is a little cute jumping spider. You see these jumping spiders probably around your house, on the outside of buildings. Um, they, they stalk flies a lot of times on the sides of buildings. So if you watch them, they'll crawl up close and then they'll try to jump on a fly. But they're, they're, the, they're the cute little teddy bears of the spider world. Uh, they've got giant eyes. And then the other fun thing is that they have a safety line of silk that they leave behind when they jump. So if they jump and they miss and they start to fall, they only fall a little ways because they're attached by that little line of silk that they put down before they jump and they can crawl right back up to that, that silk to where they were. These are great for playing with. This is my, my youngest son, Daniel, when he was even younger um, in our backyard playing with a little jumping spider. Um, you could hold them in one hand and let them jump to the other hand. If you wanna move your hand out of the way so they fall, then they'll crawl back up to the hand again. You can just have hours of fun with jumping spiders and then, and then please let them go. 
I want to breeze through a couple things here. Um, ants, you don't think of ants necessarily as predators maybe, but they are, they're really important predators. They also have a sweet tooth though, so you'll see them on plants that produce nectar and on plants like sunflowers that produce a little extra floral nectar or outside the flower nectar on the backs of the plants or on the leaves of the plants. Um, some of them farm aphids where they are are protecting aphids from predators, but they're eating the honeydew, the little sweet secretions that come out of the back end of an ant, of a of aphid. And then just a couple other predators that um, are interesting, things like lace wings that come to your lights uh, at night, don't look like predators, but are. Ladybugs are predators, of course, they feed on aphids uh, and other things. Uh, this is one that people might uh, mistake for a firefly, but it's, or a lightning bug, but it's a soldier beetle and it can be a predator, but also feeds on pollen. Uh, some do look like predators, like these ground beetles or tiger beetles, which run around on bare ground and catch prey really easily. They have amazing mouths that look like uh, something from an alien movie. And then there are things that have the, the kind of robber fly mentality where they have these puncturing mouth parts. This is an ambush bug, or an assassin bug, I'm sorry. Uh, this is an ambush bug, which is an assassin bug-like insect with a little stockier build. And then there's winged predators like dragonflies um, and, of course, things like praying mantises, which if you see a giant praying mantis that's three or four inches long, it's probably a Chinese mantis, uh, which is a non-native species. But the thing with praying mantises is they can turn their heads, uh, they swivel their heads, like which is very unusual for insects, and they have these little dark pupils in their eyes that look like they're following you with their eyes, like, like, uh, like a human would. They're very, very charismatic. Those pupils are actually not real pupils. They're actually a, a trick of light. It's just the way the light uh, refracts from the, the multifaceted eyes that they have. But boy, if you start looking at them, uh, they sure look like they're, they're paying attention to you uh, even more than they actually are because those pupils follow you around and their heads swivel around to follow you as well. So these are two Chinese mantises showing that you can have green and brown uh, and still be in the same species. The idea that the females will, feed, will eat the male's head after they mate doesn't happen very often in nature, we don't think, but it happens more in captivity for some reason. Um, this one is not a Chinese mantis, it's a European mantis, another non-native species. And if you see that spot under its armpit, a black spot with a white center, is a really good indication that you're looking at a European mantis rather than a Chinese mantis. They can both be pretty big. And then there's the native mantis, which is the Carolina mantis. It's not the only native mantis, but it's the one that looks like these bigger, other bigger mantises. And it could be green or brown also, but they tend to be more speckled and kind of rougher looking and a lot smaller, maybe two to three inches at the most, closer to two usually than some of those bigger uh, non-native species. But mantises basically just catch their prey in those front legs and they chew, chew the head off usually first and just eat it from the, from the top down, uh, including pretty big prey like this big sphinx moth and even things like hummingbirds sometimes if they can catch them. So it's 4.15. Uh, we can take another couple of questions here maybe and then I'll spin through the rest of the, the slides real quick. Awesome. So we have a first question from Amy asks um, if the sensory hairs on spiders are our hair or if there's a different name for them? Uh, that's a great question. Um, most people call them hairs. You're probably right that there's a more technical name for them, but I don't know what that is. The people, the spider people that I talk to when I ask about them, they call them hairs, but they're probably just doing it for my benefit as a non-specialist. Um, for spiders, Kelly's wondering if you know of any good spider field guides. <sighs> Uh, no, I wish. Um, there may be some out there. I'm not aware of them. The, the best way for all of the invertebrates that you want to look at, uh, if you look at the bottom right of this slide, bugguide.net is a really great website where you can browse through and find something that looks kind of like what you're looking for and just keep clicking on things that look similar until you end up with it. Or if you have a photo, you can submit the photo and an expert will look at it for you and send you an email. Uh, letting you know that they've identified it and go on the site and see what it is. So that's the best way to do this. But um, no, I don't know of a great spider field guide. I wish there was one. Um, Dash is wondering, he's five, and he's wondering um, how you know which ants are boys and which are girls. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, 
Sometimes you can tell by the wings. A lot of times males later in the summer have wings on them and they fly around to mate. Uh, the queen ant uh, is really easy to tell because she's three or four times usually the size of the other ones. Um, so she's definitely a female. And then almost all the other ants you see are going to be females. Hmm. So if, if you're not sure and you just guess, you're probably going to be right that it's a female. Cool. Um, do all jumping spiders have that line of silk ready when they need it? All the ones that I know of do, but I'm, I'm certainly not going to say that's guaranteed. Um, are the non-native species of the mantis, um, are they beneficial or invasive? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, there's a debate about that. I would say, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we can argue anymore that they're beneficial. A lot of them were brought here because we thought they were beneficial and they do eat a lot of pest insects, but they also eat a lot of beneficial insects. And really the difference between a pest insect and a beneficial insect is tricky anyway, because it depends on the situation. Um, so it's neat to see them around because they're fun and they're big and they're interesting, but they probably cause more damage than they cause good. And they definitely have uh, suppressed the numbers of the native uh, mantises that we have. And there's some research that I've seen that, you know, there are insect species and even spider species that basically they can't find those species in a prairie that has a lot of Chinese mantises, for example. And they don't think the mantises are eating them, but the competition is so strong that those other predators just leave because they can't compete with mm. them. So they're probably more negative than good. Um, Angel's wondering how big the praying mantis egg sac gets. Ah, good question. A Chinese mantis can almost, it, their egg sac can almost be the size of like a ping pong ball. And they're a big round, almost like a styrofoam looking globular shaped structure that you can see stuck to bushes or grasses over the winter. Um, the other mantises have more linear shaped, more like a little burrito made of styrofoam that you see, and they can be maybe an inch long or uh, three quarters of an inch. Wow. And then last question here, Melissa is wondering um, if all wasps are pollinators and if they're good for ecosystems and the environment, considering that the general public sees them as only as pests. Yeah, I mean, the second question is easy, and that's yes. Wasps are very definitely beneficial. Uh, I mean, there are certainly things like paper wasps that, you know, they build their nests in uncomfortable places for us, and, uh, you know, they're very defensive. And so if you get close to their nest or start to mess with them, they'll, they'll come out and sting you. But for the most part, um, I, you know, in terms of pollinators, a lot of them are. I wouldn't say all of them are because I don't know that for sure, but I think the, the majority certainly are. Um, or at least they feed on pollen and nectar. Um, and, you know, again, just like predators uh, of all kinds and, and parasites of all kinds, they help control populations of lots of different animals and sort of keep everything in balance. And if we didn't have predators, we know by from lots of different research projects that ecosystems fall apart pretty quickly. So, yeah, they're an important part of the system. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll um, end with Sophie's question. I think Sophie was five. She is wondering what your favorite bug is. So wait just a minute, I'll get to it. I'll show you in a minute. Okay, awesome. All right, uh, I quickly want to just talk about a few more things. One is that there are a lot of species of insects that are migratory, not just the monarch butterfly, which we all have heard about, um, but dragonflies are migratory, multiple species of them, including this meadowhawk that I see this species a lot coming through Aurora every, every fall. Um, many moth species are migratory. Um, the painted lady butterfly is a migratory species that's actually found all over the world. It's on every continent except Antarctica. Some of the migrations it makes are really long distances. The ones that we see in Nebraska start out in the desert southwest every year, and then they migrate this direction during the summer. And then on their return trips, sometimes they can have huge numbers. I think it was 2017 when we had a big eruption of these. And on their way back to uh, the desert southwest, there was a flock of butterflies over the Denver airport. They got picked up on radar because there were so many of them. So there can be some incredible migratory species of insects or migratory phenomenon out there. And I wanted to talk about how to distinguish between some different kinds of insects, because this will be useful, I hope, to you. Bees and flies, we talked about earlier, can look really similar. Um, bees tend to have longer antenna. Flies have those little short stubby antenna. You really look close, bees have four wings and flies have two, but that's pretty tough to see. Uh, you may not want to get that close to a bee to pick it up and try to look at that. Um, 
But if you look at the eyes, the eyes are huge on flies and almost touching each other and their short little stubby antenna kind of set them apart. But they can look a lot like bees sometimes. So here's a fly, big eyes, little tiny antenna. Here's a bee, long antenna, um, smaller eyes. Here's a fly, you don't really notice the antenna. Here's a bee, you notice the antenna. So hopefully that's helpful. Dragonflies and damselflies uh, are similar in a lot of ways, but dragonflies are faster flyers. And most obviously they, they rest with their wings out usually, um, more like an airplane. And they, their eyes are so big that they almost touch or sometimes do touch on their head, where damselflies tend to rest with their wings folded behind them. Uh, and their eyes are sort of out on the ends of their eye of their heads more like a like a hammerhead shark in a way um, So not quite as big and, and stuck together like they are in dragonflies So that's one way to tell or a couple ways to tell those apart Grasshoppers and katydids are actually pretty simple. Um, you just look at the antenna grasshoppers have short antenna um, and Katydids usually have antenna that are longer than their bodies even when they're really young, they can have tiny little bodies and great big long antenna. So those are katydids. And then moths and butterflies are kind of on a spectrum. Um, but what we typically think of as moths and, uh, versus butterflies, you can tell by the antenna also, where moths have long, long antenna that kind of taper off on the end. Usually they're fuzzy looking uh, because they use those antenna to find the pheromones of their own kind, where butterflies tend to have a long antenna with a little knob at the tip. So this is a fuzzy brown little insect, but it's a butterfly because it's got long antenna with a little knob at the tip. This is a skipper. Um, this is a moth because it's got fuzzy antenna. Here's another moth that doesn't have super fuzzy antenna that are obvious because we you have to look closely to see it, but you notice how they taper off at the tip rather than having a little knob. That, that makes it easier to identify as a moth versus this one, which is a butterfly. Okay, I want to end with a couple of stories of just individual insects that I appreciate. This is not my favorite one, Sophie, but we're getting close. Um, this is an oil beetle, which is a kind of blister beetle. And all blister beetles secrete a yellow substance that's really toxic. And if you touch it, get it on your skin, it'll cause blisters. So you don't want to hug them necessarily, but they're really fascinating. Oil beetles in particular, their larvae, when they're first out of their eggs, are very mobile. They're very small and they have a really neat little trick where they, they climb on top of each other. They make a pile of themselves and they emit a chemical smell that smells just like a female bee. And a male bee will be attracted to that thinking it's gonna come find a female to mate with. It lands where that pile is and all of a sudden that pile sort of uh, crawls up on top of that bee and the bee flies away because it's startled and it's disappointed by what it found. If that bee does find a female later on and mates with it, all those little larvae of the oil beetle will crawl off the male beetle onto the female beetle and they'll hitch a ride with her for a while until she goes back to her nest. When she gets back to her nest, all those larvae hop off the female, they go down into the nest and they eat all the eggs and all the larvae. That's their food source as, as little tiny larvae. And then they'll uh, kind of hang out and grow to the size of uh, whatever they need to do to become adults and then they start that process all over. So not only is it a, a toxic beetle that secretes this poison for us, and you don't want to eat them or hug them, uh, they also have this really cool strategy where they uh, become an enemy of bees, which I know sounds bad, but it's a really cool strategy, um, and we wouldn't have to worry about it if bees had enough habitat that they were doing fine. But this is not what's causing the, the problems in the bee, in the bee world. Um, we talked about wasps earlier, and I showed this photo of a paper wasp. This is a mimic of a paper wasp, and this is a mantid fly, which is not a mantid or a fly or a wasp. It's in its own kind of group with, with antlions, surprisingly, uh, as its closest relative that, that you might know. But it has that sort of same kind of front leg, uh, the, the, the raptorial front leg like a praying mantis has, but it's got the same shape and the same color pattern as a paper wasp, which is really neat. There's a lot of mimicry in the world, but this is a great example. And here's, here it is uh, trying to catch this little ant because it's a, it's a predator. And then here's another mimic. This is a robber fly. Uh, we talked about robber flies earlier. This one, of course, looks a lot like a bumblebee, but it's not. It's a robber fly. Look at the antenna, how short they are. Um, and it has caught a beetle. 
And imagine yourself as a pollinator. You've got so much to worry about already. The world's falling apart around you. There's all kinds of predators out there. But you land on a flower and you look at over across the flower and what you see is a bumblebee. You say, oh, bumblebees, that's great. I like bumblebees. They're like me. They're, they're pollinators, nothing to worry about. And then bam, that's the last thought you ever have. Because that bumblebee was not a bumblebee. It was a robber fly and that's not fair. And then Sophie, here it is. This is my favorite insect in the world. Um, this is called the camouflaged looper. It's an inchworm uh, that's not very big and it feeds on flowers. So the one that you see here is feeding on the flower that I showed on the left, which is purple prairie clover. And what it does is as it eats the flower, every once in a while it'll stop and it'll take a piece of that flower and it'll glue it to its back as camouflage. So it makes its own disguise out of whatever it's eating so that it can hide on that flower and not be, not be spotted. So this one's easy to see because it's crawling up the stem to the next flower it's gonna feed on. But once it gets on the flower, it blends in really incredibly well. As those little pieces of flower start to dry up, it'll replace them with something fresher. And when it changes to a different kinds of flower, kind of flower, it changes its costume. Here's what it turns into as an adult. This is the wavy lined emerald moth, which is the adult form of this, of this uh, little inchworm. And here's the same species, but on a black eyed Susan. So you can see that it took parts of the center of the black eyed Susan in this case and stuck it to its back as camouflage. And when it just sits there still and lays down on that black eyed Susan, it's almost impossible to see. So that's my favorite insect, uh, although the choices are pretty hard. So that's the end of the show. Um, we've got time for more questions. I can stick around if people want to stick around longer than 4.30. Um, we can just go until we get all the questions answered if we want to. Thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely amazing. I just want to go outside and look around now. Well, be safe if you do, but do it. Seriously, so cool. Um, let's see, do we have any questions for Chris? I guess I'm curious, okay, here we go. Kathy's wondering what the relationship between the, um, between the yucca moth and the yucca. She's just wondering what, what's it called? What's that relationship called? Oh, mutualism or mutualistic relationship. Um, and it's, it's actually hard to find pure mutualistic relationships because usually in any kind of relationship in nature, one of the two species tends to have some kind of an advantage where it gets more than the other thing does. But this is one that gets held up a lot as an example. Um, if you want to read more about it, I, my blog, the prairieecologist.com here on the left, I wrote an article, I think in 2010 on yucca moths. So you can go to that site and then just type yucca moth in and you can find a little post on that. Awesome. Um, Paul, who's 10, is wondering if it's true that when a wasp is killed, other wasps will come and attack. Will attack whatever killed the wasp, you mean? I think so. Um, it can be true, and I think there are some species that, that uh, let out a, sm a scent or a smell when they're afraid or when they're being attacked that brings others to them. Um, I don't know that that's true with all wasps, and, and you, have to, you have to remember with, with wasps, they're just like bees, some of them are colonial, where they live in a big group, and they can all attack at once and protect their, their kind of great big, big colony, but a lot of them are not, they're, a lot of them are solitary, just like bees, and so they're not really built the same way, um, where they will sting you, but only if they have to, and only the females sting, so that's only half of them, right? Um, so yes, they can be dangerous. And we don't, fortunately in Nebraska, have as many uh, wasp species as somewhere, say, further south, where there are some that can actually be really dangerous to people. Here, unless you're super allergic to them, which happens, uh, it's more just painful than anything else. Jake is wondering what the habitat for the wolf spider is. Um, you know, they can be just about anywhere. Uh, they can be in woodlands and prairies, any, any you know, be in your backyard. Um, if you look closely, a lot of them are not all that big, uh, and especially this time of year, the ones that sort of overwinter tend to be the little tiny juveniles that are maybe the size of a dime with their legs spread out as far as they go. They're not, they're not big at all, but some of the species can grow to the size where, you know, if you put them on your hand and, and they were laying flat, they wouldn't cover your whole palm, but they might be close. They're, they're the biggest spider that I know of that, that we find in Nebraska. He's also wondering if they spin a web or if they burrow. 
Uh, yeah, they tend to have burrows or they or they'll have they'll go underneath a log or a structure of some kind to, to have their babies or, or or to hide at night or whatever. Um, but you do see them sometimes in a burrow. You'll see a like a dime size hole or a little bit bigger that's silk lined. And if you look inside, you can see the silk all the way down lining the outside of it. That's usually going to be a wolf spider hole. Cool. Um, Jan's wondering what the name of the butterfly that your favorite insect, the... Uh, oh, it's a moth and it's the wavy lined emerald. Why is it that um, the moths and the caterpillars have different names or the butterflies? <laughs> well, I think a lot of times it's because it, we still don't know which, which turn into which. Uh, because it's really hard to figure that out, right? In fact, that's a great citizen science project for people mm -hmm. is, you know, if you see a caterpillar and you know what it's feeding on, you can bring it in and rear it on that and then see what it turns into. And if you take pictures of both, it might be something that we haven't seen before. Or, you know, we know what it is as a caterpillar. We know what it is as a moth. We don't know that they go together. Um, just in the last maybe decade or two, we've started to learn a lot more about that because people are starting to study them more. Um, and there is a caterpillar field guide now, which is a relatively new thing. Um, thought maybe I had it behind me, but I don't. But uh, I think it's just field guides to caterpillars of North America. Cool. Um, George is wondering if there are any insects that are endangered in Nebraska. Uh, I don't think we have any that are listed in this endangered species except the American burying beetle, um, which is a really cool insect. It's a it's a giant burying beetle. Can be, you know, inch and a half, almost two inches long. Uh, it feeds on dead animals, uh, and it's it's found in Nebraska at much higher numbers than than in other parts of its range around the country. So it's actually doing fairly well in Nebraska, but it's threatened right now uh, by a number of things, including light pollution. We think but also uh, the spread of eastern red cedar trees and kind of just woody encroachment all over the place. Uh, it does best in Nebraska on kind of sandy or loose, lust soils, and it likes big open grassland areas without a lot of dense trees in it. Interesting, that's interesting about the light pollution. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, it's really hard to study insects in general, but there seems to be enough evidence, at least in this part of the world, that light pollution is a problem that, it, that we should be paying attention to it. Hmm. There's probably a lot of other insects that are the same way. We just don't know enough about them, but that's an endangered species, so it gets more research. Hmm. I've heard some things about light pollution in humans too, but that's probably too much to go into. Yeah, oh, it's a, it's a really fun subject to dig into for sure. Is, uh, Stacy is wondering what the smallest spider in Nebraska is. Boy, I have no idea. Uh, I, but I do know that I, I see some tiny little ones out there. And it's hard to know because a lot of times, again, when they're, when they're just hatched out of an egg, they look tiny. And then some of them grow bigger. And then some of them don't grow very big. And then, so it's hard when you see one to know if that's an adult or just a young one. That's a good point. There's probably 400 species of spiders, I'm guessing, in Nebraska. Uh, I don't think we have a comprehensive, I know we don't have a comprehensive list, but the people that I've talked to, their guess is like four to 500 spiders, which is about the same number of bee species we have in the state, we think. Um, I don't know them all. CJ and Kathy um, are both wondering if the Salt Creek tiger beetle is doing better. Oh, and that's a great example. That's, that's the other uh, listed species I should have thought about. Um, uh, the last I heard on that species, I don't, I don't know that it's doing better, but it's still around, which is pretty incredible because in a good year, they'll count a couple hundred, uh, you know, in, in its range, which is just, that's not very many for an insect species. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I think it's listed as a threatened species, if I remember right. And, you know, that's a subspecies of another, of a, of a larger species. So it's, the species itself is doing fine. The subspecies that, that specialized on those salt marshes around Lincoln is not doing very well, mm. mostly because most of its habitat is gone. So it's hanging on for now. The reintroduction process that they've done has been some, somewhat successful. They've, they've boosted some numbers with that. But again, there's, just, there's only so much habitat, so there's only so much we can do with them. Lynn is wondering if there are any insects or bugs that cause allergies. Uh, 
I know you can, I mean, definitely you can have allergic reactions to bee and, and wasp stings, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know of anything that would, eh. Yeah, I'm gonna pass on that because I just don't know and I don't wanna say anything wrong. I'm not sure. Not, not that I know of, but I don't know. Carla is asking if there are other bugs that are affected by red cedar trees and how um, those trees affect bug populations. Yeah, I mean, eastern red cedar trees, uh, and again, all the other woody species that sort of convert grasslands into woodlands, mm. they, they can definitely affect things. They, they affect it by changing the plant community beneath them. You know, they start to shade out the plant species, which changes the plant species that can be there. And as we talked about earlier, you know, there are host plants that are important for some insects. and Plant diversity in general is important for insects. That causes problems. It changes the temperature on the ground. Uh, a lot of insects, things like grasshoppers, as, as an example, like to be warm. So they do best in places where they get full sun. And they can't do that if there's trees covering them up. Um, it changes lots of ecological processes in general that just affect the entire ecosystem that, of course, affects the insects that are there. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that eastern red cedars are problematic for, as well as all the other trees that are sort of invading grasslands right now. And that's, that's going to continue to get worse with climate change. Um, the way the, the way the annual climate patterns in Nebraska are moving, it favors woody plants and it favors the, the C3 or the cool season plants like early season grasses and a lot of wildflowers, some of which is good, some of which is going to be problematic because a lot of invasive species seem to do better with the way the climate's changing. So it's um, keeping woody plants out of prairies is going to be harder and harder to do and we have to keep finding more and more ways to do it. Mm. Has there been any um, talk around the Nature Conservancy about, uh, you know, strategies for prairie conservation and, and ways that we might be able to kind of aid in that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, some things are fairly easy to describe, like with eastern red cedars, one great way to stop eastern red cedars is to have uh, more people learn how to use prescribed fire comfortably and safely um, because cedar trees are killed very easily by fire when they're fairly small. Um, it's not the only way to control cedar trees, but it's a way to do it on a large, lot of acres at once. Mm. Um, so as more people become familiar with and comfortable with prescribed fire, that helps a lot with cedar tree control. Um, you know, most important thing with prairies right now is to stop plowing up the prairies that we have left. You know, we have parts of the state like the sand hills, which are still incredible resources for grasslands, but a lot of parts of the state, um, the prairies we have left are small and fragmented, which doesn't help much when you're trying to, you know, support populations of species because they're on these little tiny islands of prairie. And so we need to keep what we have left. Uh, where it makes sense, doing restoration where we use a lot of different plant species and actually restore a very diverse plant community back along the edges of those little fragments or in between fragments that connect them back together, that can have huge benefits in terms of um, making more viable populations for the species that we have left. Um, and then, I, you know, honestly, to me, the most important thing is to get people to think about prairies. Because I think for the most part, if, if you mention a prairie somebody, they might have this idea of like Little House on the Prairie uh, on TV or something like that, for, for, for the most part, it's just sort of a flat, boring area full of grass. And if, if that's what you think, uh, you're probably not gonna be much of a proponent for prairies. And so I think, you know, things like I'm doing here, showing people the diversity of life that you can find in a prairie, introducing people to the species that live in prairies near them. So not just prairie dogs and bison and things that can live in big prairies, but what lives in a prairie in your backyard, you know? Um, and using native plants from prairies in your garden is a great way to get familiar with them. So then you go out to a prairie, you see the friends that you know because they're in your backyard. Uh, those sorts of things, just getting people to care more about and be more familiar with what prairies are like is our best strategy. Because if you know something and you love it, you're gonna advocate for its conservation and um, that's how we're gonna save prairies. Thank you for that. Um, one last question. I'm just curious um, how you got into this line of this line of work as a career. If there was something in your childhood that sort of butted this uh, interest. Sure. I mean, I always spent a lot of time outside as a kid, uh, whether it was in my yard or my my family went 
uh, camping and fishing quite a bit. So I was, I was fortunate in that respect. I grew up in elementary school age. I was out in Bridgeport, Nebraska, out in the Panhandle. Mm. Um, so got to do a lot of things out there. But then uh, prairies, I didn't really think about or, I mean, like most people, I don't think I really thought about prairies until I got to college. And I had a friend that came up to me and asked me if I ever thought about prairies. And I said, no, not really. He said, yeah, nobody does. Why is that? And so the two of us got some other friends and we started learning everything we could about them because it was sort of an underdog uh, situation that made us interested. It's like, why, doesn't, why don't people care about this? This is like the dominant resource of our state. Um, and so that's, that's what got me. It was, it was the fact that nobody else was really paying attention to it. And it was something that uh, once I started you know, learning about it, it didn't take very, very long for me to get excited about it. Thank you, that's cool. Um, I guess we'll end with this last one. This is a good question to end on. What do you like about studying insects? <laughs> uh, everything. Um, it, what's, what's great for me, you know, I, I'm, I discover insects mostly through photography because I'll be out taking pictures of flowers and there'll be an insect on the flower or on the plant next to the flower or whatever. And I'll turn around and just turn the camera and take a picture of that. And then I have to figure out what it is. And so what I like best is that every time I take a picture of a new insect that I don't know, if I can figure out what it is, either through friends or bug guide or send it to experts or whatever, then once I know what it is, I can look up the story behind it and what we know about it. And every single time there's a fascinating story. Um, it'll be something like that oil beetle, you know, with the larvae that, that hop on bees and ride them back to their, their, their nests or something equally interesting. And it never fails to amaze me uh, what those stories are. So that's the great thing about insects and invertebrates. And, and, and then, you know, if we don't know what the stories are, then you just have to use your imagination and hope that somebody at some point takes the time to study it because you know the story's there. We just don't know what it is yet. It's so cool. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. This was really an amazing uh, presentation and I'm sure everyone else as they're signing off has been saying thank you as well. Um, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So hopefully we can cajole you to come back and do another one about prairies later on in the year. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, for now, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be checking in on the prairie ecologist and keeping up with the nature conservancy. So yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs>